mailing. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. My mate Simon Lusk is probably one of those most in tune with American politics. He listens to podcasts on his way to his favorite fishing and hunting spots. Let's talk with Simon now and find out his views on what is going on in the U.S., who he follows and listens to, and more importantly, who he ignores. Good morning, Simon. Welcome to the Crunch at Breakfast. I hope I haven't interrupted you getting out to your favorite hunting spot. No, 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 Cam. I'm going hunting this afternoon. Happy to be on the radio with you. <laughs> I thought I'd get you on because, you know, one of your sayings I use all the time, it's harder to pick than a broken nose. And, you know, this last two weeks, we've watched the attempted assassination of uh, Donald Trump. And, you know, a lot of people were sitting there saying, oh, he's won the election now. And you're going, mm, not so much, uh, not sure on that. Now we've got Joe Biden uh, quitting the race um, and and the absolute tragedy of his exit. Um, How are you reading this? What are you listening to? What are you uh, reading about this? Who Basically tell the listeners how you keep yourself informed as a political consultant about what's going on in the United States. The the first thing is, is I follow the guys that have got a proven track record at winning campaigns. Um, And and that means um, Pod Save America, who are Obama's guys, uh, and they were pretty scathing about Biden and to the extent that Biden was getting stuck into them for not being supportive enough. Um, But they're also realists. They're they're very liberal, but they know about winning. Um, And then I follow um, Hacks on Tap, which is uh, Mike Murphy and David Axelrod. And and people may remember that Axelrod was one of the first to come out and say, Biden can't win because he's too old. Uh, And Biden's team went absolutely nuts at Axelrod. Um, But Axelrod was right. You know, from uh, the, the midterms in 2022, the numbers were really, really tough on Biden. People just didn't think he was fit to be president. It, it wasn't, they didn't like his uh, policies or, or what he'd done. They just thought he was too old. And, you know, that isn't something that you can ever recover. And he'd gone out with the watch me, and we did watch him. And within about the first three minutes of the um, the debate, it was obvious that he was well past it. And, and wasn't fit to be president. And that meant that he got rolled. Well, the next week he appeared at the, after the NATO conference, and I, I know you were watching it because we were chatting at the time, and I was watching it, and I thought what we were watching was cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, he, he just wasn't up to it, but he didn't realise it. And um, I, I take a somewhat different view to many people who who thought the media were covering for him, I think the media were absolutely furious that he hadn't been given, they hadn't been given access to him. So they, they'd sort of heard that he wasn't that flash, but every time they said something, they'd get bashed by the Biden team. And when it turned out he was a doddering old git, they um, they absolutely went spastic and, and really went after him. I mean, you and I were sharing... Uh, screenshots of, of New York Times front pages that were just like it was three weeks of unremitting brutality saying this guy's got to get out. Well, the, the Democrats have got a real problem now, though, don't they? Oh, look, I, I don't know they necessarily got a real problem. Um, I think that anyone that is making bold predictions at the moment is, is just deluded. Um, the, the only prediction that I think you can really make is that the election is likely to be very, very tight and come down to a few thousand votes in three or four states. Uh, I don't think that there's going to be a landslide against the Democrats now, and, and I don't see that the Republican vote is going to collapse either. Um, but beyond that, uh, you're very brave to make any predictions. I mean, so many guns in America, it only takes one nutcase with a gun to, to change it again. What about the claims that you're seeing in some of the media in the United States that Kamala Harris is in the same position as Jacinda Ardern when you know Labor replaced Andrew Little as the leader and selected her and then Ardern went on to win. Personally, I find that specious. 
because um, she's the incumbent. And uh, and whereas Bill English uh, was on the way out, and so it didn't really, it didn't really, it doesn't resonate for me as an excuse. What do you think? I think it's bullshit. I mean, they're just deluded. Um, uh, Jacinda was personally very, very popular, um, running a, a campaign where she didn't need to win a plurality, plurality. She needed to win the coalition negotiations, which she did. Um, a very different matter than a, a head-to-head race with an electoral college. Um, and you know, Jacinda had very high net favourables. Kamala Harris's net favourables are sort of minus 15 or something. So uh, she's not popular like Jacinda was when, in 2017. Um, what she does have is a huge number of people that want to beat Trump who are throwing vast amounts of money at her. I, mean, I think she got $81 million in the first 24 hours. Um, and that's before they really turn the taps on. It's, it'll be a multi-billion dollar campaign. Simon, so, mean, Nate Silver has a reputation as getting things right, although I'm not sure it's 100% now. Um, certainly made a big name for himself. He subsequently left 538 uh, and gone out on his own. He runs an election model, uh, but 538 is also running an election model. Which one are you following, or are you looking at both of them or others? Uh, look, I, I am not looking at Elliot Morris's 538 model. It just looks ludicrous. Uh, and uh, I think that it had Biden and Trump neck and neck, which just doesn't make any sense at all to anyone that's got any political insight. Mm. Um, Silver's model is is a work in progress and is, is pretty good, but I'm also watching The Economist. They've got a decent model, and The New York Times, the tilt is always worth following Nate Cohen. Um, and it, it's like what uh, Farrell always tells us about polling. You never look at one poll. You look at everyone's poll, and you sort of net it all out. And I think that as long as it's not an absolute outlier like like Morris's 538 one, which was saying Biden and Trump were neck and neck, um, you you can look at the models and, and work it out for yourself. But they're all saying it's a pretty tight race and it's going to be very tight in the, the swing states. When do you think we'll get an indication in the polls about the fallout of the last couple of weeks? I don't know that. I, I, think that I, I always defer a polling question to, to our Pinko mate. Um, he'd, he'd be able to give a better answer than I would. Yeah. Those swing states are vitally important. That's what Morris Williamson was saying to me in uh, 2020 and 2016. The number of votes that decided the election race was about 55,000 votes in about five states. Do you think that's going to be um, the same for this election? You'd expect so. It's a polarised electorate. Uh, There is going to be vast amounts of money trying to expand the electorate, but no one's quite sure how that's going to work. Um, And the polls are pretty tight at the moment. The polls are showing that Trump is ahead in most of the swing states, but that was against Biden. And there's still over three months before election day. So a lot could happen between now and then. During the 2020 election, Kamala Harris got absolutely slaughtered in the Democrat leadership stakes uh, by another candidate just pointing out her appalling record as a prosecutor, uh, a history of uh, grandstanding, and just tore her apart, and she ended up with about 2 or 3% of the, of the vote and, and dropped out. Is there a risk now that, that Democrats have wedded themselves to basically a flake uh, candidate who giggles at the slightest drop of a hat and doesn't have any substance? Yeah, but she's not got dementia, um, which is a big improvement, and America's pretty polarised. Um, she was underwhelming. I, I thought she would do better in the the, um, the first uh, in the twenty twenty primaries. She she got twenty thousand people along to her launch in Oakland, and she did some really good campaigning stuff with historically black college uh, women's groups and mm. she just missed out somewhere. I think there was probably a, a degree of no one really trusted her and didn't think she was very authentic. But yeah, at the moment she's likely to be a vessel for what the Democrats want and what they want to do is beat Trump at all costs. So they'll probably overlook the fact she's not a great candidate um, and just get behind her. 
But if I was Trump, I'd just bash her all day long on her performance on the border of the southern states. Yeah, and I think that that's uh, inevitably going to happen. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether she uh, just comes out and says, well, I wasn't able to do what I really wanted to because Joe wouldn't let me. Um, and and see what uh, Trump has to say there. Um, and, you know, the, the dynamics of, um, of attacking a female opponent are not it's not always bad, but I would want to be testing that really hard before I would go after her. Um, I think it's inevitable that immigration is going to be an but how much they make it her problem. One of the things that I've been interested in is that there's a whole lot of left-wing ratbags going on about how she's going to be more pro-Gaza. I'm thinking, oh, I don't know about that. Um yeah, the the, uh, the Jewish lobby is, is wonderful, um, and unlike ours, they invest a lot of money, and, and I don't know that she's necessarily going to be more progressive on, on Israel, um, and I don't think there's very many votes in it. She might sort of say, oh, yeah, we've, we've got to win Dearborn in Michigan, um, but I, I'm just not sure that that's actually going to happen. Well, we've just seen uh, the Jewish lobby in... Uh, in the United States, take out a sitting, uh, you know, was it a senator or a congressman they took out? Um, ran a very congressman. Uh, congressman yeah, yeah, yeah. They they ran a very robust campaign, and uh, that was that person was actually one of the what they call the squad, the ultra left wing uh, and, and, radical type co- um, congressman tipped out because of um, significant campaigning against him. And and Jewish groups put. 15 million plus into beating him uh, because he was soft on Israel, uh, soft on Gaza and, and didn't believe that rape and murder and, and terrorism needed to be dealt with as firmly as the Israelis are dealing with it. I, the one, I just, I really struggle when I watch videos of Kamala Harris and um, you know what I do when I analyse politicians. I turn the sound off and watch their facial expressions, looking for micro expressions. I then close my eyes and listen to them speak, and then I can see where they're lying and things like that. I'm not vibing Kamala Harris, but I'm not sure the electorate is as switched on as you or I. They would probably just vote for her because she's a woman. Yeah, look, I I think there are probably going to be a lot of people that are going to vote for her because she's not Donald Trump. And the the polls that I'm going to be really interested in is is the, the swing voters that are called double haters who hated both Biden and Trump, and do they hate Harris as well? Um, and that could be the, the determining factor in the election, is what happens to the double haters. Yeah, they might actually hate her slightly less or um, or more, depending on her performance. Um, it's going to, I mean, she's really going to be in the hot seat, though, uh, and really be under the gun. And all of the videos of her with her trite little statements that she uses in almost every speech is just going to get replayed over and over and over again. And people are going to sit there and go, really? Like, seriously, are you, are you on this planet? Because that's the fe- that's the feeling I get, that she's not all there. I mean, yes, she hasn't got dementia, but she doesn't seem to have, a, have, have uh, any sort of uh, position on anything. Uh, and would probably be a pole driven fruitcake. Yeah, well, she could well be, but she just keeps coming out and saying, I'm not Trump, and, and that may be enough. Mm. Well, it'll be interesting to see if that, that does come through. So who who do you think is not worth actually listening to? We've already covered the 538 guys who seem to be out to lunch. Oh, yeah. No, no, that's the model. I still like the 538 podcast. Those guys are quite sensible. It's just the model is out of whack. Um, there's there's some – I mean, I have a real prejudice wanting to listen to campaigners because they're just realistic. And it's, it's very much like how you and I can get on with all the left-wing campaigners and we may not be able to get on with even the right-wing politicians. Mm. But the backroom people were just – you know, they, they're realists. Like they, they, they're not going to say, "Oh, this is going to happen." They, um, they'll if, if they don't believe it, they've got to believe that something's going to happen before they'll say it. So, yeah, I, I follow those guys closely. Um, there's some good pollers. The um, 
uh, yeah, uh, Christian Soltis Anderson, uh, and um, there was uh, there's a number of others. Uh, Sarah Longwell. Um, anytime they speak on any of the podcasts I listen to, they're really good because it's like talking to Farrow. You know, he doesn't project his feelings on the polls; he just gives us the numbers. Mm. I, I was um, I've been following for a while uh, the Liberal Patriot uh, on Substack. And, you know, I don't agree with them on politics, but they have some pretty good articles that um, middle of the road and an explanation that is easy to understand for most people. Uh, on the other side of that, you've got people like Simon Rosenberg, who is an absolute sycophant for anything Democrat. And just three days ago was pushing on about how Biden was going to win the election and everything like that. And um, and now he's uh, you know writing about how fantastic uh, Kamala Harris is and it's all good the campaign's on track, and I really struggle to believe a word he says because he's such a lock for the Democrats. Yeah, um, I, I mean I also love the Liberal Patriot. I think those guys are really good and and they're uh, once again they're background people. Now um, the the Hopium Chronicles which you you mentioned, he. Um, in his defence, was about the only one that picked what happened in the midterms. And he, he believes that the fundamentals were going um, in favour of the Democrats, and that's why the Republicans didn't win in, uh, anywhere near as many seats as they thought they would. Um, mm. But, you know, he might have been, he might as well have just put Biden's Pravda on his bloody website because that's what he was, he was like Pravda. It just wasn't objective. Um, you, don't, you don't have credibility when you're not objective. No, no, no. And I think uh, The Economist had a wonderful line where um, they said that uh, Biden, the, the politician who prides himself on the, uh, on common, on his common touch, seems to be asking us not to have any common sense. And, you know, that that's, that's just like, yeah, you know, we'd all looked at Biden and whether we liked him or not, it was just obvious he wasn't fit to be president. He just looked like a curmudgeonly old man who had, um, slowly but surely ebbed away. Yeah, 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 and unfortunate uh, and obviously disappointing for him, but but it's just the reality. And, you know, I, I, uh, I've had many arguments with people about whether the media were covering for him and, and um, the uh, left-wing podcast, some of the other ones like the New Yorker and some of the New York Times ones have just been really scathing and, and – they're sort of saying, well, the media have gone after Biden and Biden's team because we thought this was the case, but they wouldn't let us see Biden, so we couldn't know. And you know, the, he he missed the the softball Super Bowl interview, and you know, he just missed opportunities to get out and and sell his vision. Um, and it was because he couldn't be trusted to actually speak properly um, without a teleprompter and um, in an interview situation. And even when he did use a teleprompter, you get all sorts of garbled um, nonsense coming out. But to be fair, so does Donald Trump <laughs> when he's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, neither of them are, yeah, uh, great orators. Um, but look, that the other person that um, I. Well, well there's, there's two politicians in America that I think that anyone that really understands how politics works really admires. And, and that's. Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, and both of them are just utterly ruthless at getting stuff done. And it was yeah, like Pelosi was the one that was really after Biden because she could see them losing the, uh, Congress really badly. Flung in behind Harris and said, yeah, okay, well, it probably means Harris is going to win. If, if Pelosi's behind her, uh, no one's going to run against um, Harris in the Democratic nominating process. Well, when when I saw that Pelosi had come out against Biden, I knew it was over for him, because uh, yeah. the only thing sharper than her claws are, are the, is the knife that she's holding that she's about to shank you with. Yeah, and and apparently she told Joe that he could go the easy way, he could go the hard way, and that on Monday she'd lined up a whole lot of people, a whole lot of elected representatives, to come out and say he's got to go. Um, and that was one of the things that forced him out. And. You know, she, she, the other story that, that is widely reported is when he was saying, oh, I've got polling that shows me I can win. She demanded to uh, talk to his uh, campaign guy, uh, Mike Dolan, and um, and get him to um, 
to explain the route to victory because she didn't believe there was one. And that turned out to be pretty much the truth. Well, when old Nancy turns against you in the uh, in the Democrat Party, you are finished. Really, she's you know she's been there about as long as Joe Biden has, and uh, she's a survivor. You know, I might not like her politics, but I can admire her tenacity in getting what she wants. Yeah, and you know they're the, the same as as said about um, Mitch McConnell. He's he's an absolute master of political process. And how does he survive? By being ruthless and by being an exceptionally good guy with numbers and, like Pelosi, being an exceptional fundraiser, which means that he can fund campaigns and and build favours that way. What amazes me with Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell is they're both distinctly unlikable people and yet they get elected every time they come up for re-election. And without fail, there they are like, you know, the um, mythical lizard people, they they seem to always uh, be there in the thick of it. Yeah, and, and it's a testimony to their professionalism and their raw talents. And, and the Democrats was worried about Biden and no one seemed to be able to move him, but Pelosi did. And, you know, that that is just, she's world class. I'm looking at this race now and I'm going back to your original uh, statement uh, that I've used for years that it's harder to pick than a broken nose. Although I'd have to say that the advantage is slightly in Trump's favour. What do you think? Oh, I think that the polls and the models reflect that, but they reflect that as of Sunday. And you know, it's going to take probably a week for the first lot of polls to come through and really show what Harris is um, is going to do against Trump. But I I think you're right. Trump is slightly favoured at the moment, and the polling and the models all say that. And I guess we'll uh, firm up. Um, that's the good thing about Nate Silver's models is he's constantly updating them. Yeah, and the other good thing about Nate Silver's model is he says he's very direct about it. He says, look, you know, I'm saying someone's got a two and three chance. It means they've got a one and three chance of losing. And I think that that's likely to be that the model will be pretty close to um, to even, and with someone slightly favoured, and he'll be saying, well, you know, if it's if it's a sixty percent uh, in favour of winning, they've still got forty percent chance of losing, which is is quite high, and they're not going to be definitive. It's it's perhaps or well, it's it's definitely not like um, two thousand and eight and two thousand and twelve where it was pretty obvious that Obama was going to win both times if you followed the models and you followed the models and was it Leighton Smith that you won lunch off because he didn't believe the models? Yeah, Leighton Smith didn't believe the models and he was, you know, backing, uh, what's his name from Utah? Mitt Romney. A forgettable candidate at the best of times, but um, there was no way that Mitt Romney was going to win. And I, I made that bet on air with Leighton Smith at News Talk ZB, and he lost, and we had a sumptuous lunch uh, down at Yeah, Sale. and I'm sure you went, yeah, you didn't really want Obama to win, but you were just a realist about it. And I think that's probably the, the thing to bear in mind is you just need to be realistic. It's, uh, set aside your preferences and look at what's actually going to happen. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. In order to do what I do and what you do in this game of politics, it's not that you have to be right, um, but often we are. And the reason we are often right is because we just look at the data and remove the emotion from it. Whilst we might like, for example, Christopher Luxon to be, you know, a popular leader, he's just not. And there's no amount of soft no. that's going to show that. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that some of his caucus um, colleagues will be out polling him if somebody bothered to do those polls. I think it's just inevitable. His net favourables have never been very good and he's not a particularly likeable person. Um, and, you know, we're just realistic about it. We don't necessarily care one way or another. It's just that's the reality. Luxon's net favourables aren't great. Yeah, I mean, I, I literally don't care. Um, I'm not a member of any political party. I'm a political commentator and a radio host and a journalist and it it shouldn't matter what I what I personally believe, I'm just going to call things as I see them and what the data shows me, and that's why you know I'm regularly on the phone to to our pinko mate 
David Farah, uh, so I can get the numbers to find out, you know, where where I should be heading on my reckons rather than um, tilting at windmills, which a lot of pol- political commentators seem to do. Yeah, and they project their values on the electorate, which is just as dumb. Um, and they also project onto the electorate that the electorate actually care. And, you know, that's one thing to bear in mind in the US. If they have 50% turnout, it'll be uh, about average. And, you know, that means half of Americans probably aren't going to vote. Now, some of them aren't going to vote because it's the electoral college and there's no point. Their state is so one sided, it's that their vote isn't really going to matter. But, most people aren't that engaged in politics. And it's one of the things that Obama's guys are constantly on about. You know, you, you, it's not the thing to political podcasts. That it's the people that sort of stick their head up near election time and start thinking about whether they're going to vote perhaps as they walk into the, the ballot box. And you know, that that is what usually wins elections is getting those swing voters who haven't made their mind up until the very last minute to vote in the favour of your candidate. Well, it's, it's as Morris Williamson said, it could come down to as few as 55,000 votes across various swing states. I mean, you look at California, that's a lock. The Democrats are going to win there. The Electoral College votes will go that way. Um you know, there's a lot of other states that are like that, but it's those swing states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and places like that, New Hampshire, that actually swing around uh, Georgia even, uh, and those will be the ones that decide the election. Yeah, I don't think New Hampshire's probably in play uh, since Biden's gone, but um, the other ones, yeah, but but Biden's route was, was really Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, and he needed one other state, and you know was, uh, he was trailing so badly in in um, Nevada, and and he wasn't going to win Georgia. Um, it, it just uh, uh, Arizona, he wasn't going to win. Uh, just not easy uh, to see how we'd win those, and I think he was trailing in Michigan, and you know he needed to really to, for him to win, he needed to win. Uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and um, uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, so so it's going to come down to those few uh, swing states. Now, what? Give us your final thoughts, uh, Simon. Before we uh, we run out of time, uh, what should we be looking for, and when will we get a sign about when that uh, you know the, the, the election is going to fall one way or the other? I'm not sure that we are going to get that. I think we may be wondering what's going to happen on election day. Um, I think that there's still you know, Harris has to be confirmed as the candidate, and then I'd expect we'd need a few weeks of polling um, to really know what what her chances are. But I think that we can safely predict it's going to be closer than what it was when it was Biden. And I just tend to think anyone that is willing to make any prediction beyond that is probably not worth listening to. Um, they're, they're just, it's too hard to predict with so little data and in an electorate that is so close. Well, that's right. The data's all changed now and it's uh, down to uh, Kamala Harris, assuming that she gets um, gets the nomination from the Democratic Convention. But I guess they're all locking in behind her now. So uh, we'll see within a few a few weeks, um, how the polls and how the models are shaping up, and then we'll get a better indication from them. But it's a completely open race again now. Yeah, and you know, a couple of weekends ago, we were very close to losing Donald Trump, and you know, it's not impossible that that could happen. You'd hope it doesn't, but it it may, and you know, that would change the dynamics again. So you can't be a hundred percent certain of anything at the moment. No. All right, Simon, thank you very much for your time this morning and uh, we'll have you back on the show again, no doubt, uh, in the rest of the year. So looking forward to hearing your reckons again. Thanks, Cam. No worries. All good. As you can hear, Simon's dialed right in to what is going on in US politics. That's why I listen and bounce ideas off him. Tell me what you think, email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, dislike what you're listening to, 
Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.